Signore e signori, buonasera. Buonasera, welcome to New York University, Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò. Uh, we are very excited and delighted to have a chance uh, to celebrate the life and the career of Sandro Manzo here tonight. Uh, his strong fan base is a guarantee of the success of the evening. <laughs> and the occasion to celebrate uh, Sandro and his life and his achievement, especially in the, in the world of contemporary art, is due to the publication of this brand new book. Uh, and you see the cover here, and there are uh, copies upstairs, unfortunately only in Italian for now. And if you want to buy a copy, Sandro and Fiamma will uh, sign it for you at the end of the evening. Uh, I was, first of all, when, when Fiamma came to see me as she comes uh, normally, at least a couple of times a year, she told me that she wrote an autobiography and I thought of herself, and she said, I wrote an autobiography of Sandro. <laughs> and you've got to love that, that um, their union, and uh, I, I thought it was so touching that Sandro now told me, I'm lost without her. No, because I can't hear. And she <laughs> 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 I'm perfect. I'm not on somebody says, she asked. Un suggeritore. <laughs> but, uh, but I thought it was so beautiful that they went for this title. And it's the autobiography of Sandro because it's the narrating voice of Sandro speaking through the pen, ideal pen, or the computer uh, of Fiamma. And as you know, Fiamma is a writer in her own right, and she published books, and she were. And she's an accomplished journalist. She was the correspondent of many Italian publications here uh, in New York. So her uh, gift of writing is beautiful and well known. And I think here it achieves uh, different levels because there is a lyricism in what you narrate. And your involvement in the story of Sandra, obviously, uh, is a further contribution to, uh, to the beauty of this book. Um, we also have um, guests with us, as you know. And they are uh, Vincenzo Mato to my left who is <laughs> Vincenzo is a sculptor and artist and also an actor. I followed the beginning of his career as an actor and I can say he reluctantly became an actor he, because he <laughs> you wanted to be an artist and then life took you in different directions. So he's a, is an artist in many different connotations uh, of the world. And we have uh, Shoja uh, Azari to my right uh, who is originally from Iran. Uh, he's also a very accomplished artist, and especially video art is uh, his specialty. And the opposite side of me, Fong Bui, uh, who is the publisher and artistic director of the Brooklyn Rail, that I also thank for the very nice write-up that he dedicated to the event here tonight, very prominent on the art scene here in New York. So we have a great panel, thank you. And my idea was that I would sit down and I would enjoy, once again, a conversation between Fiamma and Sandro, because they don't need anybody else. Uh, but they asked me to moderate, so I will give them the start. Then I don't think they're going to need m many more inputs from me. And then we're going to ask a few questions to our friends who uh, bring us joy with their presence on the stage. Fiamma and Sandro, when and how did you get this idea of telling this story outside of your family and outside of, of the people who love you? Chi l'ha avuta l'idea? Is it Fiamma or Sandro? Uh, you, so <laughs> you wrote your son. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you, everyone knows, when uh, you feel an urge of saying something, uh, you have so much passion. And you start going on like it's necessary to do what you're doing. No, it's on. Uh, something happened in, my, in our life. Sandro, after uh, half a century of having his, uh, his art gallery in Rome, closed the gallery. And uh, he became, little by little, so sad. He became another man. I couldn't recognize him anymore. So one day, it was August in New York. It was very hot. I told him, Sandro, why don't you sit next to me and you tell me the story? 
So we sat together, literally every day for four or five hours a day, and I was practically whipping him because I was <laughs> forcing him to give me details, colors, faces, smells, uh, episodes. And so we spent uh, eight, nine months sitting next to each other. Then after four hours, exhausted, he would leave, and I would keep being there and editing. And uh, this has been an amazing journey and an amazing ride for us because uh, it took us together through his life, not only that, but it helped us to transform something that was really hard to accept because uh, the, his art gallery was his life, as you can read, uh, maybe if you read some of the chapters that we translated. And so uh, this uh, pain that he had was transformed little by little, telling his story, and became something joyful and creative and took us tonight here. So it's been an amazing, amazing transformation. Thank you. Thank you for being Thank here. You. And Sandra, she said everything I'm as right. always, right? <laughs> but she wrote. <laughs> but Sandra, everybody who knows you, even uh, on a very superficial way, knows that you're a great storyteller. You're fascinating, charming, and it's part of your heritage. And Napolitans love telling stories, whether singing or, or telling them. Yeah. And you also told stories through the art and the artists with whom you worked. Um, and within these artists, you have stories for each of them in, in, in the book. Uh, do you want to start by telling us something at the, about the very beginnings of Il Gabbiano, yeah. uh, the origin of the gallery and how you uh, started? It was already very competitive in, in Rome because the scene was full. How did you, did you make your way in that very busy, lively art scene in Rome at the time? Yeah, my idea was to leave the small town. The Province, you know, I was from Torre Annunziata, I am, which is a very small town near, now it's almost small, near Pompeii, and which now they found the most beautiful uh, Roman artifact, the Villa of Pompeia, which is something if you ever go to Naples, you should go. The t a train take you just in front of the villa, which was a place where we used to go when we were children and anyway. So my idea was uh, to leave, because I was in Switzerland for many years of my life. I did all my um, study there. And when I came back, it's a stupid story, but I came back from Switzerland to, Ro to, to Torre Annunziata, and I was having some French fries, and I said, do you have any mustard? Senape. Senape is mustard. So people didn't know what was the mustard. So we are in the 50s. I said, if they don't know what is the mustard, why should I live in this town? <laughs> so I left. <laughs> That's a story. <laughs> no, but the people say, you tell stories. Everybody has a story. The problem is if you tell, you think people don't care. You see, everybody laughs. That's the story of my life. Everything starts for the most. So, I <laughs> and, uh, and then I went to Rome. And, uh, and you know, then the other thing is that I was a self-made, uh, that I have to say. I didn't do anything better than other. But I had the passion, which I still try to keep. Beside the moment I was a little depressed, you know, that was a moment. And I'm still depressed, you know. Tonight, no. <laughs> I can't be depressed tonight. But I would lie. <laughs> because for me, the Gabbiano, I had no college degrees. I don't know, I didn't know anything about art. Nothing, nothing at all. Because I, I start from zero. I said, where I can put my feet? There was a, an opening in, in the art field, so I, I stepped, it could have been like, could have said Maserati, or I don't know, that was the thing. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, that... We probably would have been more depressed if you sold Maserati. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm still depressed because for me, the, the gallery was a two. You know, if you have a college degree, you can talk about, I don't know, uh, technology, somebody has to talk about Shakespeare, somebody boring you with Shakespeare, somebody can bore you with... <laughs> I don't have nothing, you know. Well, for me, the gallery was a two. So I met, for example, uh, Vincenzo was a, a very young artist. I did a show. And then in the middle, in the, in the going away uh, all of my life, I met uh, Shirin and Shoja and all the Iranian group. And then I did an Iranian uh, today in Rome with all the Iranian. And for me, it's like that. Now, last night, we were talking with Fong about what we are going to say tomorrow. 
I said, there is no problem between him, me, and Shosh, and Bicelli, there is a lot of that. Fiamma is the only silent person. She <laughs> writes, but she writes, that's important. So, <laughs> Julie, can I go ahead? Okay. And, uh, <laughs> she's my moderator. I have a moderator. I say, like, she's the real moderator. Yeah, yeah. She should be here. Actually, I want to thank Julia. She did all the, ca the iconograph iconographic research for the book. She went to Rome to r look at 200 photographers of the gallery. All the old uh, history was very difficult. And also, she has been. The first one who read the book, because everything I was showing, and this has been my critic and my inspiration. Thank you very much. Brava, Giulia. And then, <laughs> and uh, Fiamma says, you, I say, I thank Fiamma. She said, you don't have to thank me. To do. Say, yes. If I, you were not there, I would have never had a book. And I w the title of the book was supposed to be in the Neapolitan dialect which is a language recognized by UNESCO now, recently, would have been I am nobody, non so nessuno, which sounds very nice. In Italian, would have been nice. But uh, the Electa people, which I thank them very much, they did a great job. The book is beautiful. The, uh, the book is beautiful what's done, not what I say. I don't know she said. But um, anyway, the, they didn't want to put a, a Neapolitan uh, dialect. Uh, you know, was it? I'm sure it's always a discrimination. <laughs> <the song>. <laughs> <laughs> if I was from Milan and say, no, so this, you know, everybody would have put it. <laughs> I'm always, I have a chip on the show. <laughs> you know, we are, we are the, the thousand people. So they didn't want to, to put the title. So, no, so this, you know, every time I say, Fiamma, but I'm nobody. Why all the people has to come? And look at tonight, they all came, all my friends. I said, well, they came, so I was wrong. And then she said, no, no, you know, you have so many beautiful stories. So at the end, when I read my book that she wrote, I said, but I am somebody. I didn't know I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank you, Stefano. He has been so sweet. Immediately say yes, Fiamma told him about the we said yes right away with such an enthusiasm. I will never forget that. You can ask me anything. <laughs> <laughs> don't put me to the test. You don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. Sandro, okay. uh, tell us something. Try to describe for the people that don't know what it was like, what the Gabbiano was. It was not only an art gallery. It was also an art gallery. It was a saloon. It was, was a saloon. And the what kind of people did you find there? Uh, when would they come? When would they go? It was also strange so hours, right? Due, due to my curiosity, because I always want, you know, I, I was very ignorant. I'm, I still am ignorant. So, but I was trying to cultivate myself. So every time there was somebody that has intelligent, uh, that was uh, left wing, obviously, you know, in Rome, and also now, you know, if you are a good person, you can't be. You have to be in left wing. So. I <laughs> <laughs> It can be, you know, you are from the right, I don't want to see you. So anyway, and uh, <laughs> discrimination, the other. But anyway, my curiosity to meet new people, but not to, to drop names tonight. Once Julia told me, you drop names. But I was the name. <laughs> I don't drop names. If I have been with Visconti, what shall I say? I was with, <laughs> I was with Lucino. Which for me, was a bit, I was proud, I'm proud, and uh, I think people want to know story about Visconti. So that's what I was not saying. Oh, I was with uh, Buñuel, and I was with Buñuel, but I was with Visconti <laughs> and Moravia, all these writers. And at that moment, they were all alive. Now they're all dead. That's uh, I, I'm the last, maybe the last one to go. But I stay for a long time. <laughs> maybe she's going to write another book. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You don't have to come. <laughs> But also Sandro, because we have a different audience. We need more new people. You know, can be always <laughs> the same. Uh, and uh, so this was the idea. So the, the, uh, the Gabbiano, then she's going to read this uh, chapter in Italian called uh, uh, The Green Room, and the book called The Green Room, because the, the green room was the office where we, everything was bright. And in the 60s, all the gallery in Rome they had canvas on the wall. They were brown and uh, they, were now, they were bright, very white. So it was something completely new. And the only color in the gallery was the, the green room. And the green room was a, 
a saloon and she will tell you what was the green room, which is very detailed, what is the no, green room. No, I would like a phone, a short, I am in charge yeah. of the phone. So that was, sure. a, that was the idea of the, and then we went on and that night we had meetings. Anyway, then we can go on, we have time. No, we don't that too Very much. Good. Let's start with our guest. Shorja, why don't you tell us how you got to know Sandro and uh, your relationship with him and art and what, whatever he wants. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess it uh, was about 10 years ago yeah. that we met. And uh, I remember Fiamma had a reading. Uh, that's where we met. I think he was here. Yeah. That's, that's where it was, yeah, yes. yeah. And that's where we met, and, uh, and then they have been so generous ever since. I, you know, it's almost second home to us. They feed us, mm -hmm. take care of us, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's become really their home has become a second home to all of our friends, basically. Sure, now we, we uh, we're there eating almost like two two times a week, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Sandro was uh, kind to invite uh, uh, Shahram, my friend here, uh, who is we collaborate together, and I, and we had a show together uh, at his gallery in Rome, and. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for us. And, uh, and it was unfortunate that it closed, you know. So <laughs> it, was, uh, it was very sad. I, he was sad, you know. And we also uh, became very sad that it closed. But that's how we met, you know. Thank you. Last night we were talking about what the gallery was which kind of gallery it was mm. you were saying with fong no fong remember you were talking about the art world behind the screens what was the purpose of the gabbiano gallery uh, usually galleries should be business oriented as well and in sandro's case it was more yeah business was necessary but he was uh, more enchanted by the meeting with the artists the relationship the traveling with them no it was a different kind. It, uh, it was a, a cultural salon, so to speak, where it was not just artists that showed their work. There was filmmakers, he mentioned Visconti, Moravia, um, but there's also younger poets, novelists that would come and share their ideas there. It, it's sort of not that different from what we do with the rail, but just a side note, I just want to share with you, one day, it was probably about four years ago, that um, Serene and Soja invited me to have a Vietnamese meal in Chinatown. And there was Sandro's Manzo. <laughs> and I look at Sandro and said, Sandro Manzo? <laughs> and he looked at me, probably don't remember the last name, my, my name, because we met super brief. It was on the occasion of my travel in grant to Italy. I was barely 20 years old. And I met Sandro through my former teacher, Italian-American painter named Nicholas Garone. And it was right in front of his gallery where he was walking with a beautiful, tall, Danish, red-headed person named <laughs> Marete. She was a painter. She was a painter. But you can imagine the charm seemed to be sustaining super well. Even in the midst of this brief meeting, I was introduced to Marete, who I still remember. And that's how we met. But what was remarkable, it was that very instant, I came back the next day to see Piero Gucciani's yeah. show. Beautiful artists who make the most poetic subtle pastel uh, in the light of probably close to Redon, but there's a certain mystical landscape ambience that very much rooted in yeah. Roman landscape, I would say. And there are many others, but there's a legend grew and grew. And when I met Bautus, he did also mention, you go and come and see uh, Sandro Manzo. So there was many instances, because at that time in Italy, in the late 80s, 
there was a certain American artist yeah. who seemed to migrate to Todi, yeah. Umbria yeah. particularly. Yeah. Exactly, and you did manage to show some of our friends, yeah. William Bailey, yeah. and that's how it, I met. And Alex is here. Thank you. Yes. So that was. So that's how it was yeah. beginning for me to know Sandro. It was a wonderful time in the late 80s. To be in Italy was ecstatic. I was telling Shoja and Fiamma and Sandro last night uh, when I was there, 20 years old trying to study Florentine paintings. And I remember driving very fast, faster than Italian, <laughs> on autostrada, and all we get stopped by the police, you know? And all I have to say, the sono, sono pittore, you know? And they just so happy. <laughs> and say, vai, 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 vai. And so I never got a ticket in my life, you know? <laughs> so to go back to Sandro, there was that insistent charm and that generosity. And when we did reconnect it four years ago, uh, it was immediate. It was a brother. It was amazing. Uh, it yeah. It was a cold night. Yeah. I it was a cold night. And I was uh, very, you know, I'm always vain, you know, even at my 70 days. When this gentleman came in and said, Sandro Manzo, I said, my God, he's a Gary Cooper. Or <laughs> <laughs> Sandro Manzo, said, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> and I was with Shirin and Shosha, which are, Artists, which I'm sure say, oh my God, if they think I'm important, you know, that is always my life, I will be insecure, and I want to be important. Important for what? <laughs> <laughs> Before we pass the microphone to Vincenzo, and following I up want to, to introduce yes. uh, Fong. He's an amazing artist. He's uh, the uh, publisher of uh, an incredible. Um, magazine called uh, the Brooklyn Rail, and I would invite you to make to make a subscription to yeah. the magazine. No, but it's true. It's free already. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> why, why did you close the gallery that was so su successful? No, because it was successful for because he talked about culture. But once Bernard Shaw told to his publisher, he said, why do you talk always about culture? Talk about money. <laughs> he never gave him money. So there were no money. In Rome, people never bought painting. So I could uh, have an outreach. So either uh, I had to decide. I had to close the gallery. There was nothing to do. It was no a political consideration at all. I mean, for a gallery that uh, described itself as communist. I mean, uh, it was. Uh, <laughs> what you are talking about? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 that no. wasn't the case. No, it is not the case. <laughs> no, Italian no but you know, Italian, uh, either they have painting in family, and they don't buy, and now the, the new world is changed, you know, everything, uh, people buy less and less painting, the market uh, is a big crisis, even here where the, the art is so booming, but it's very difficult. Uh, so the gallery in Rome, the last, uh, since 19, 2012, was, was going down economically, I couldn't afford any more. And you know, the Euro, I used to make, a, like an idiot, I used to make money here and sustain the gallery. I should have made the money here, invest here, and today it would be much better for me, you know, but I was bringing to Rome to keep this gallery. But just because, well, I like it. It was, a, I'm glad we say, well, not because I was making money, otherwise I would have never closed. You know, to have a gallery in Rome, an office in New York, was like uh, to be a jet set, no? <laughs> then next month, where do you go? I go to Rome. Oh, yeah, you have an opening. Oh, I did 200 openings. So can you believe that? So. Vincenzo, the, the uh, point of view I of don't an know. artist. I don't know where Fabiano. to start because so many things, because uh, I owe everything to Sandro because I moved to America in 93. Uh, I was making steel furniture in Rome huh? and uh, I saw Sandro Manzo for the first time, uh, he didn't see me, uh, near El Gabbiano. I passed by, there was an opening there, and I, wouldn't, uh, <laughs> and I wouldn't dare to go in because I didn't consider myself an artist. I was making these things, uh, like paintings and making furniture. But I remember this very well, this scene, people like vomiting like out of the gallery, a, lot, a huge crowd coming out, and then the, the sky was dark. And then he came out uh, of the gallery with a long black cape. <laughs> and, uh, 
and the uh, and the long hair like he had uh, like a, a night of the apocalypse he turned around <laughs> he turned around he shouted two things <laughs> i was uh, like about to say okay i'll go and i look at him and i say oh my god like i'll never uh, this i never talked to this guy like uh, this is not my world <laughs> it's like and he flew away with the cape like <laughs> <laughs> And then, then like a year or two later, I moved to America and I was working uh, as a metal worker in New Jersey in a shop. And then he contacted me because he, he knew my mother. And he said, I know you moved to America. Let's meet. And so we met. And so he said, you're not going to recognize me, so I send you a portrait. And he sent me like 20 portraits of himself, <laughs> <laughs> like painted by many artists. And that's how it started. And then... Uh, he did everything for me because then he invited me to to have a group show at the Gabbiano and then I had my first uh, solo uh, exhibition at the Gabbiano and then he introduced me to my art dealer here in New York, uh, Earl McGrath. Uh, so everything, uh, and he gave me food the first time, <laughs> the first for the first time I was here, I was, I was very hungry <laughs> and uh, many things. So I owe everything as an artist to Sandro. But it was really... Uh, the, it's, it's very interesting for me because I leave that gallery, I arrived always late, you know? I feel I always arrive late to, like, when I talk about the Mediterranean Sea that I love, they say, eh, hey, but you should have seen it, like, uh, 40 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> there was the, the fish was coming, like, huge fish, like, uh, now it's like, <laughs> or whatever, you go to... You go to a beautiful town, I moved to Rome, ah, Rome, it's like, oh, it, you should have been before. <laughs> so when I met Sandro and I finally invited to this Gabbiano, which was like a place that I, did, I thought I couldn't really walk inside, invited to show a piece, I was like immediately reminded, but you know, here, there, it's like, uh, you should have been here like 30 years ago. <laughs> and there were, the place was the same, the green room, but there were like uh, photos of, uh, th there was all these great people. And still there was, but some of them, er, they were already dead. And Sandro didn't live there anymore because Sandro moved to America. So this was a place that, where things had happened really hot and amazingly when he was there. Then the gallery was this like jet uh, propulsion, like uh, a rocket, you know, you need this, all these uh, propulsion mo engines. Uh, and then a little thing goes to the moon. But there is this huge... So the gallery sent him to America. But then I remember, Sandro, let's be frank, uh, for many, since I know you, you're like there, like uh, doing your amazing life and always thinking, ah, I gotta go to Rome because I gotta take care of the gallery. Because the gallery was always your wife uh, abandoned, like uh, the previous <laughs> wife uh, who's abandoned, but she's the mother of your children and she sent you to America. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> and, but the most amazing thing that I learned a lot from that uh, was that I had the privilege uh, with some other artists like Bernardo here and many others to have this last touch uh, with the time that doesn't exist anymore because we were having a show in a gallery that was like actually a salon still because I was going every day when I had a show to see if somebody had come to see the show or whatever. Just being there near my babies and there was like, I would sit there in the green room having a scotch, uh, cigarettes, uh, scotch, cigarettes. Uh, and people were coming, like the most uh, unexpected, like strange people, like uh, a professor, like, or the old guy, the guy who had the store there, like, but still like people who were not, nowadays, like the galleries are not like this, because like, can you imagine like you go to a super, super amazing gallery in Chelsea, do you think you find the either I don't know, like a cool writer of the moment or the poet of New York uh, hanging out uh, at the gallery there. They don't even let him in. <laughs> I don't think, <laughs> I don't think they let him in. <laughs> so first of, I think there is only people, you know, with the huge expensive cars, you know, and they, they look like killers. They enter there, <laughs> they, they do their investment uh, and they leave. No, I mean, if you look at the conversation that happened in these galleries, they are kind of scary. You think you are in the Russian mafia meeting. <laughs> Instead, in the green room, it was a world like a gallery, you know? It was like at the end of the tunnel, there was this room and there was people having a good time. Yeah, that's the room, you see? 
Can you imagine, like, uh, I don't want to name galleries here, but I mean, think don't about the. Ecco, let's not. Drop <laughs> So yeah. nowadays, but I remember the first year, second year, I would say, yeah, but maybe we, we there, maybe we should do everything like we should help like making it more like sh let's paint this room white, everything more like New York. Instead, this was very precious like this time. Yes. And so I really think, but don't, don't be too sad about the gallery because that was a time of your life. That was, she sent you to America, uh, you know, you were tired of this thing. Uh, Sandro, let's be frank. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Vincenzo, and when you started acting, you became a very successful screen actor. What was uh, Sandra's reaction? Did he encourage you or did he tell you, oh, let that alone, continue doing it? No, the, the thing is this. Uh, in, unfortunately, in, this, in the art world, I don't say I'm an actor. Because and so I try to hide it from him too. <laughs> like and he doesn't like to talk about it. because both the people who buy my work uh, they say ah they say, ah now you are an actor like ah, you don't work anymore so like basically implying that all the stuff that I bought from you is not worth anything anymore. I mean like you're not gonna make a, you're not this sculptor anymore. Like so, you so I feel like uh, no I feel like I betray them. Instead, it's not true because mm -hmm. basically what I do, I work as a sculptor every day. And when there is a, a kind person who invites me to work in a movie and to pay me for that, I go for, I close the shop for 20 days and then I come back. I mean, it's like it's not a big deal. In the, mu in the art world, I don't tell them I act because it's bad. In the movies, I don't tell them I'm a sculptor because immediately <laughs> the producer, the first thing he does was like, okay, let's talk about how much you're going to be paid. You are an artist, so <laughs> like... Uh, Why not for free? Like, uh, Vincenzo, Vincenzo, uh, when the, the, the writer, Robert Graves, you know, who's known for having written this marvelous historical novel, I, Claudius, remember? He's actually a very good poet, but very few people knew. But when he was asked how he was able to maintain these two activities simultaneously, he said, well, it's like breeding my dogs in order to feed my cat. <laughs> I think that's what... <laughs> <laughs> Fiamma, why don't we listen to a passage from the book? And I know passage you... To India. <laughs> we were talking about the green room, and, uh, and can I read a few lines from the chapter? the chapter called The Green Room to give you just a glimpse into what it was. Aspettiamo un attimo, so Fiamma is going to read okay. from the original Italian and you have the translation on the screen. Non era una stanza, ma era un club. Era allo stesso tempo l'anima e il cervello della galleria. Laura, la mia socia, viveva inchiodata alla sua sedia, dietro al tavolo, sistemato lateralmente per non farsi vedere da chi arrivasse. Il mio invece stava esattamente di fronte alla porta, così che volendo avrei potuto controllare il viavai del pubblico da lontano. Di giorno lavoravamo, discutevamo, progettavamo, ricevevamo gli artisti e i clienti. Alle sette di sera la scena cambiava. Si svuotavano le scrivanie, Luciana preparava un vassoio con whisky e noccioline. Quella stanza tutta verde si trasformava in una specie di arena. Man mano che bevevamo, le discussioni si allungavano, si infervoravano. Abbassavamo la serranda a metà e rimanavamo lì fino alle nove. Chi c'era, c'era. Erano delle serate allegre e tempestose, perché ognuno era accanitissimo nelle proprie opinioni. Il che, per esempio, intimidiva chi avesse voluto comprare un'opera. <ride> D'altro canto, sarebbe stato triste se il gabbiano non fosse stato un luogo d'incontro, una fucina di idee, dove ritrovarsi la sera sicuri di farsi pure due risate. Grazie. E Sandro mentioned, and of course, Sharjah also, uh, the fact that you, uh, the, the gallery, among many other things, uh, devoted an exhibit to Iranian artists. And how come that idea came about? Through the meeting of one artist, or what were you uh, pursuing? Did you have a plan, or what sì. was it? No, I, perché l'Iran? Perché I told you, through Shorja uh, and Shirin and the group, I met all these artists, and I met uh, Sharam Karimi, which is a great Iranian artist. We became very close friends. How, and Sharam is somebody you cannot befriend, because he's immediately in your life, he knows 
is very participating. And we did the show uh, of Sharam and Shoja together in Rome and then in Paris. And then I gave a show, uh, a one-man show in Rome to both of them. And then one day, you know, that always the tool, no? The tool for me was to enter in a new world because in Rome, who is going to do the Iranian artists? We're talking about 10 years ago, it's almost, I told Shaja and Sharaf, would you curate a show of the young Iranian artists? Uh, and we did a show called I Iran Today, which was very, you know, Iran Today. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what it, it happens all the, and now when uh, somebody comes as I'm Iranian, immediately I'm much more, uh, 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 I have a good proposition because they are a very, very wonderful, intelligent group and you meet really interesting people. And you know, if I still had the tool, there would be uh, so much to do. And uh, you know, so much to do in all the, 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 also the third world everywhere. There is new, new market, new, we talk always about wars, but be, Beside the war, there are people who paint. So why not do a show of uh, a guy in Afghanistan? There must be a great painter there. Uh, we can go uh, the Iraq. They all paint. You know, besides, it's like during the the with the black people. They were they were dancing and they were slaves. Behind the slavery, Larry Rivers did all these beautiful drawings and painting of the. Um, a slave at night dancing, having a good time. So there was a life that now there is a life everywhere. So there is no tool, there will be no show. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm sad, Vincent. But I'm no more sad. How can I be sad? If I'm <laughs> sad, God is going to be upset. You know, <laughs> why? Is it, what I don't want. There is a chapter that. I, I have a chapter here which some friends said they like it very much. And the chapter is named uh, in English the a dog named Lenin, <laughs> the father of the revolution. Il, un, cane di nom, un cane di nome Lenin. Quella settimana a Roma, per i cinque pittori fu memorabile. Tutte le mattine, sempre insieme, in fine indiana, scendevano dalla collina del Giannicolo in galleria e passavano la giornata insieme. Ernesto arrivava con il caffè, poi loro si mettevano a girare per la città in cerca di jeans, calze, scarpe da comprare perché in Russia non si trovava niente. Ma non avevano soldi e gliele compravamo noi. Loro per sdebitarsi e ringraziarci della mostra ci lasciarono delle opere su carta che noi poi ci vendemmo per ripagarci almeno delle spese. Per esempio, this is one of the episodes. I did the show of five Russian painters who were in the Venice Biennale the year before I did. Nothing was for sale. So I spent... I don't know, there was money to do, you know. I had the money to do this thing, now you, and it was a very successful show, because my idea was to show to the Italian bourgeoisie, and not only bourgeoisie, this paint, you don't have only uh, pa Russian painters who they do propaganda, uh, Stalin, Lenin, or whatever. You have, they knew how to paint a hand, yeah. you know, and, they were, and the show was very, very successful. What year was this? Was, uh, 70 something, in the 70s anyway. You didn't see it, no? You were not there. You saw the show? No. No. I was just barely yeah. born. <laughs> <laughs> okay, prima, prima di tornare a casa però ho espresso il desiderio di incontrare il compagno Cutuso, pittore comunista. Renato arrivò in galleria, ci aveva sta cosa di fare il tribuno e cominciò il suo show. Era pieno di charme, conquistava tutti credeva di sapere più di loro, mentre nella loro modestia gli fecero capire che quello di cui parlava lo sapevano già, anzi ne sapevano di più. C'era oltretutto il limite della traduzione, che era sempre Marina, mia sorella. Nella foga della conquista dei colleghi russi, Renato raccontò che aveva un cane e lo aveva chiamato Lenin. Mi accorsi che Marina imbarazzata non traduceva. Come al solito intervenne con la sorella più piccola, eh, ma vuoi tradurre? Alle mie insistenze lei tradusse e si creò un gelo totale. Lei sapeva che gli amici russi, per quanto erano colti, per tanto mancavano di senso dell'umorismo e Lenin era Lenin, non si doveva toccare. Guttuso si fece in mille per spiegare l'equivoco, disse che il suo era un omaggio, non un insulto, pronunciare tante volte al giorno il nome del loro mitico leader era per lui come un mantra. Messa la pezza a colori, si cominciò a parlare del rapporto economico con i quadri. 
loro che vivevano di modesti stipendi dell'associazione dei pittori cui consegnavano tutta la loro produzione quando Guttuso facendo un'altra stronzata senza alcuna sensibilità raccontò che aveva un mercato libero e guadagnava a ogni quadro venduto Gilinski gli disse ma compagno Guttuso quando hai guadagnato abbastanza per comprarti una bistecca e poi te ne compri due e poi te ne compri tre ma quante bistecche ti vuoi comprare? <ride> e poi andiamo tutti a cena Fiamma, a question for you um, of course um, you might have heard many of the stories and, but during this process did you find out stories that you didn't know about? And if so, which one was the one that either amused you the most or I must say that you? Sandra and I have been uh, married for 24 uh, years. And at the beginning, I was fascinated because he was telling stories all the time. And still now, I must confess that some of the stories, of course, I heard about them. But uh, many, many times, he has something new that pops up. So in the morning, for instance, we have a club. Uh, it doesn't have any more the Gabbiano, but we go to this coffee house, which is a very shabby, shabby coffee house <laughs> <laughs> in the Upper East Side on 91st and Lexington. And we sit there with our friends, and it became another saloon. We sit there and we discuss, uh, but we don't talk uh, only about politics, because now it's so sad all over the world, so we can't touch this uh, kind of uh, subject. But we talk about ourselves about what comes through our mind, about projects. And it's so soothing and so wonderful. So I really encourage everyone to get a, a little saloon somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and since many of you here probably have not read the book, but know Sandro, even if you don't, I think we can open the um, panel to questions from the audience, if there are any. Yes. You've made the Fondazione Il Gabbiano. So, Fondazione Il Gabbiano, what does it do? The eh, Fondazione can be called A Fondazione Il Gabbiano. Because <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, the last thing I did was the book. I'm, I'm thinking the, that the A Fondazione Il Gabbiano one day would be closed because I thought to continue. I just now have all the, the archive, so 50 years of a gallery. There are letters, very interesting. So I try to give all the archives to the Academy di Belle Arti. They don't want it. They, they say, but there is internet. They don't, internet fucked up everything. <laughs> <laughs> Why they need 200 catalog written so well? So the Fondazione is good just to, to, to continue a little bit of the Gabbiano. But I don't, I don't think it's going to stay on. This is the first time. Maybe they even don't know it. But Tonight I was thinking, why should I have a fondazione when I have all that? I can do a fondazione in New York and uh, reconstruct where it would be grown. So I say, let's do it uh, once a week, a meeting, all together. Let's find a space and let's share conversation. No internet, no iPhone, just talk, 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 blah, 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 blah. That's what <laughs> That's the answer. It's not, maybe it's not uh, intelligent, but that's what it is. <laughs> I want to say something that I was very touched. I was uh, one, well, just one second. I see sitting here a friend of the, the coffee shop where we all meet in the morning. His name is Patrick Smiley. He's a, a very near, uh, new friend. And we were talking about the book two months, three months ago. And he was le he's learning Italian. And he's American, obviously. And one day I came back from Rome. And he started talking to me about the book. I said, how did you? So he ordered, he's the first, after my daughter was the critic, uh, my, my Patrick was the first American who wrote the book, in, who read the book in Italian. And I want to thank him very much. <laughs> he gave me. So two-part question, one for Sandro and one for Fiamma. So Sandro, you've met so many people. Who do you think has had the biggest impact on your life? And then, because I think you'll answer this one biased, it's for Fiamma, 
who Fiamma do you think has had the biggest impact on Sandro's life? That's a very hard question to answer because uh, Sandro, as you had a, a glimpse on him, is so passionate that whomever <laughs> he meets, he, he gets engaged into his life, her life, uh, starts planning project, uh, and so uh, I can't say there are many people who were really important in his life, but each one of uh, the artists he, he dealt with uh, became part of his own life. So it's it's hard to say, and he had so many stories about with each one of them that uh, it becomes something alive. It's doesn't, uh, it's not something that stays there. Yeah, that's the only way to do it. And also, uh, <coughs> the artist, <coughs> they need a, a reference, somebody to talk, I think. And, and I w I w I've been lucky, you know, I had a wonderful life. And uh <coughs> I would be ready to start all over again because I had the privilege to meet two categories that are completely different. The artists which they are Beautiful, they are great. It was ah, the artists, they are the artists, they are the artists. They go like the Queen Elizabeth to the bathroom, they do it, and they are the artists. <laughs> and, they are, and they are people, real people, nice people. We have bad artists, not bad, like uh, they are all good, but we are <laughs> mean, mean artists, like mean uh, postmen, mean anything. And then the other privilege was to meet the collector, which I owe them. They didn't buy very much in Rome, but I think that... <laughs> <it> <coughs> no, no, but I'm talking in general about the category, like you know, in internet and your collector is a man. So for me, collector is a crazy guy who spend money to put a piece of shit on the wall. I don't know. <coughs> you can buy a house. Today you can buy, a, I don't know, a, a tennis court. You can buy everything. So, and the collector are amazing, amazing. They are not so interesting, but the artists, <laughs> uh, but they are useful. They are, we need them. God bless them. God bless. God bless. Uh, Infatti, like Sandro, voglio aggiungere. Benvenuta. In, mi fa, you just ca comes to mind, Sandro. Sono qua io. Oh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> lo so, I'm lo. Cioè, pure io well, non I'm ti vedo, I'm però c'ho il fanal. You know, la voce, però la dico no. <laughs> Ma mi ha fatto venire in mente questa cosa che tutte le volte che facevano la mostra al Gabbiano, con te, ma anche qua, quando ogni volta che mi vendeva una cosa al Gabbiano, every time he would sell something uh, of mine at Gabbiano, or even here, he would always make this face after so many years. He would say, Vice, dice, this guy is buying this thing. Dice, like, <laughs> like, like, we sold it. <laughs> we're going to sell it. Dice, we're going to sell it. He's paying this much. I told him, he said, okay. <laughs> and we were like, uh, every time, like, uh, you know, like we were trying to sell the, the, the you know, the fountain of Trevi, you know, the yeah, Trevi fountain. You know? So that's beautiful because it just came to my mind. <laughs> and by the way, before there was the photo of Sandro there with uh, his mother, and by once, just to tell you the d different kind of art dealer, Sandro, there you go. Uh, She came once from Italy to visit him and she stole the blanket from the airplane that they gave yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. And she, and in the first day she arrived at his house, she embroidered the V <laughs> <laughs> on the blanket that she stole from the plane and she gave it to me for the studio because <laughs> I was sleeping in the studio, it was very cold. <laughs> and so, she, so that's very special because they, they don't do that very often. <laughs> I still have the, the blank. You still have the blank? Of course. You give it to me. Vincenzo, Vincenzo was the first one. When he moved to New York, remember you moved to the uh, to the studio where you are. You still have the studio, right? Yeah. And it was an amazing building, abandoned building on the Lower East Side, <coughs> where there were drug dealers, and uh, it was a very bad area in those days. Dangerous area? No, not bad. But dangerous. It looked bad. No, <laughs> he was the only one in this ghost building, and he started cleaning the toilets, the space where there were the toilets of the girls. But, but no, let's not talk about me. My no, no, <laughs> but... <laughs> no, no, but she's right. No, let's not talk about my embarrassing... No, 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 no <laughs> but he's, he started... Past. Is you started transforming this building into something creative and beautiful. Now there are three theaters in that building, no? Remember? But I remember, I remember, of course. But the... Sandro, let's talk about him. 
uh, in this <laughs> toilet where I have my studio. Still now, uh, Sandro decided that one day, and I had just been here like a year, he said, okay, I'll give you a show in Gabbiano, but let's do something fantastic. <laughs> Uh, buy some cheese, some wine, and I'll bring you the ladies from uptown. <laughs> okay, and so I clean up, I put the sculptures that were about to go to the show, uh, Gabbiano, yeah. and we show them to these people. I didn't know anybody here, I just arrived, and uh, he brought to the Lower East Side in 1995. Well, it uh, was a very tough uh, neighborhood, and it was snowing. All these ladies with the chauffeur, the driver, they came uh, there, uh, to uh, they came to the toilet, to my studio. <laughs> and they were all appalled. They would say, Sandro, where did you bring us? We've never <laughs> been here in this part of town. Well, the, famo the, the famous Park Fro Avenue lady. Uh, the last frontier. But they, l they bought everything they and you even uh, introduced me to uh, Herr McGrath. We made better. some money, remember that? No, but great people came. So I was, Sandro was doing this uh, yeah. fantastic thing. That's it. Funny. Let's not talk about me. No, va bene. Yeah. Giorgia, last night we were talking about uh, this, uh, the, the different spirit of the gallery. Uh, how was it? What do you think it was, the Gabbiano? Uh, well, I, I mean, I read those few chapters, and uh, what was uh, striking uh, was what you call the salon, but uh, <coughs> I think that uh, the situation, the, the, the era, that era was very fascinating in a sense that the culture was being made. It was those, th th those uh, the green room and all uh, this, and you had cafes in West Village and everywhere else. Even in Iran, you had cafes that writers, poets, uh, artists, they were always hanging out. And, out. and that was a cosmopolitan situation around the world, you know. And it is uh, what, and I remember I t uh, talking about like what Habermas talks about, uh, community action. Mm -hmm. And this is a place that basically the idea of democracy, of exchange of ideas, of uh, political power, yeah. basically, was was created and shared, you know. Uh, and <coughs> my question was to Sandro, you know, because you experienced all of that, and what happened? At what stage there was a shift? You know, how did this shift took place, really, that we lost that, you know? We lost that kind of uh, creation of culture as we were like all active in making it, you know. Yeah. How did the power shift from the artist and someone like, you know, you that basically the business side of it was important, but it wasn't uh, like the goal. It was like some something else that was driving everyone. There was this idealism, this idea of making a better world. You know, yeah. uh, and then that disappeared. And how? Do, at what point? How did you see it to shift? <coughs> I think I have my opinion, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, mm -hmm. the eighties was uh, where the year that started screwing up everything in all over the world. But because there was so much money involved in everything, money on the market everywhere. Money, money was coming out. I don't know from where. The economy was incredible. So that the people, they start buying art as a, an I, a, a, as a the joy to have a piece of art in the world, they start buying art as a commodity. Mm -hmm. So that was the moment that my friend James Goodman tonight, is, we were talking one day with James, and James told me, you know, Sandro, we are out. When the art become commodity, we are out. That, and he was right, because there is no, no way, you know, and now you can't, you to go back to what it was, it's very difficult because the relationship are changed and everything goes through computer. Every gallery, respectful gallery must have three galleries all over the world. There is a gallery in New York, I won't tell you the name, he has 120 people working for 120 people. What they do? 
how much money they stood, mm -hmm. stole to the client. Because you have to steal the money. Why 120 people? It's like a Vespa factory. You know, you do a <laughs> Vespa with 120. <laughs> so that's what, it's a, it looks stupid, but it's like that. So money, mm -hmm. money change, my money change everything. That's what I think. It's also the ideology came that um, less people uh, engaged, uh, people are, are less interested in ideology. Everything is, is po politic, 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 you know, and uh, I, I think politic ruined everything always. That's, uh, but the, 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 the thing who changed is the money, I think. The, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the yeah. enormous amount of money on the, in the world, on the, on the table, that you arrive with all these millions of dollars mm -hmm. that before, you know, you buy something for 100, 200, but then 100, <laughs> even a, pol a postcard, you can need 200 million. 200, it's, it's crazy. What, what, what's the sense? But, but it also coincided with the fall of the Soviet. Uh, I mean, the, the whole world is sort of shift, no? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and uh, it's actually, in, in a sense, I mean, uh, 80s, I think everything became uh, depoliticized. You know, you're talking about like the green room, and you were a communist, yeah. you know? And uh, almost every intellectual at that time, poets, uh, everyone yeah. was on the left. And then when the, uh, the, the fall of the Soviet Union and all of that, it, it was like almost a breakdown of all yeah, that right. idealism, yeah. you know? Yeah, and that's right. The triumph of, of capitalism, which is falling now, of course, you know? But yeah, well, the, the, it was also the end, I think. I don't want to go in politics, because I'm really, I don't know anything. Uh, the, fall, yeah, the fall of the Soviet Union was like, this disillusion, you say, uh, you say, uh, eh? we were all this dream. I remember me too. There was this dream, and the dream never, never realized. So, was, you know, and you, you know, it's <laughs> like when you lose your parents. I think you lost, you lost. Uh, uh, that was one of the reason too. So you know, once you have the good were here, the bad were there. Now bad are everywhere, and the good they are all here. Not <laughs> Fong, I would like to ask you the, the same question. What do you think about, yeah. about this? When well, I, th I there think was that, change? that the 80s, as Georgia mentioned, was the beginning of globalization. Uh, you probably remember uh, June 8, 1998, the Tiananmen Square episode, where you experienced the most profound, disturbing happening, so to speak. You, you see this average young person, maybe a student, uh, you know, basically holding two hands, shopping bags, and trying to stop the most important day in Chinese government history, the advancing tanks of the People Liberation Army. And we were all shocked. It took a while, maybe a few days to digest yeah. and contemplate why that was so poignant. And we all come to the conclusion that it's never happened in Asia, in that in all the religious teaching, philosophy and whatnot, none have really have taught us, Asian, to be an individual. You know, that was the most incredible symbol of the uh, adherent of individualism. Essentially, it's, a, it's an image of Old Testament. It's, um, you know, Goliath and David, really. And so we know the shift begin to happen to Asia and vice versa. So it's going spreading horizontally very fast. So we know that globalization yeah. began in the Reaganite yeah. era, right after the collapse of yeah. the Berlin Wall, essentially. But earlier last night, we were talking about what's so remarkable about that 70s, in which you and Shoja, he's from Syria, you from Rome, coming from the Napoli. Yeah. But what was remarkable that period was that we know how polemical the political system in Italy could be. Yeah. Last night we talked about Mussolini, and we came to realize that Benito is not an Italian name. <laughs> you know, we realized that his father, Alessandro, had given him the name uh, because they both were socialists and very great admirer of Benito Juarez. 
and we re realized that his two middle names were uh, Amicare, Amicale, uh, you know, Gitbriani, mm -hmm. another great, you know, socialist, Italian socialist, and the other is Andrea, Andrea Costa. Right, sure. So he wrote incredible, important article for the Il Popolo magazine. What became of him is so interesting. It was the mobilization of advocacy for milita military intervention in the First War. That's how he was thrown out the Socialist Party. So I think it's always very intense. And I remember uh, seeing Henry Kissinger on television. And he, re he said, if you want to understand politics, you go to Italy. You want a political history, you go really. It's true. We know, we read and we thought about Machiavellian, but it's really always in Italy. And I think that have an effect a great deal in every moment of decade in Italy art. 70 were the advancement of Atta Povere. You know, again, it was a very dogmatic, very clearly focused on that particular uh, exploration of so called non art material and whatnot. I think what remarkable was Santoro, he didn't have a specific focus, aim, or any kind of, uh, not to say that that's the reason why you didn't become such a successful, important dealer, <laughs> but that was his central position. He loves everything, he embraced everything. He cultivated ideas so that people can come and see and share it. It's a true democratic worldview. Because I think you probably know about this story. When de Kooning was shown with Castelli, he had a certain contempt for Leo Castelli. And he, I think at some parties, say that, well, you give him some beer cans, he'll sell it. And Jasper John heard that, and he make beer cans. You know, so that, you can understand, that was the, the swing of the pendulum in the commercialization of the art world, mm. and where you stay is always on the side of the artist. You didn't choose the side of this artist against the other. You embrace everybody. And I think that is very rare in the art world. Very rare. Yeah. Bravo. Thank you. We have time for another couple of questions. Yes, Bernardo Siciliano, who is also one of the artists originally from Il Gabbiano. Bernardo. Fact, cut your hair, I didn't recognize you. Because I lost my hair. <laughs> <laughs> you lost fact, your it's hair. It's not a question, I'm, <laughs> just, uh, I'm a witness of uh, the gallery. I don't even remember when I met I Sandro. No, Hello? Ah. I don't even remember when I met Sandro. I probably met him when I was born. Because my parents were hanging out in that green room all the time. And uh, he describes you making drawings on his table. Yeah, yeah, we were we were there. I saw we were drawing those on my table and spitting a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> because he was the son of Siciliano, everybody ah, oh, he's the son of. The I remember man. saying to I remember you say always saying to me, because I was born in Rome and I was yeah. going to the Gabbiano every day since I was born, and then finally the show after I don't know, I was very young. I got lucky, he liked my paintings. And he was keep saying, but you need to move. Otherwise, you're going to be the most famous painter from Lazio, which is <laughs> the region of <laughs> That was the line. I was basically <laughs> like a background of every conversation between him and, and uh, myself. After a coffee, he was say, you need to move. You're going to be the most uh, uh, successful painter in Lazio. Move to New York. So I have to thank you. That's my, it's not a question, it's a thanking. Because thank to you, I'm in New York City. So. Thank you. So yes, the microphone here. Uh, then here. Uh, Sandro, you met uh, a lot of extraordinary people. And also in the book, I found also ordinary people that become extraordinary by virtue of their passion, like Memo. I was preparing the color for the, paint, for the painters and everything, right? And also, w one thing in your book, you said at one point, uh, life, you live it. You don't stop to talk about that, right? 
So the question is this one, right? What do you think about all this, especially young people that always have to take pictures of what they're doing, even what they eat, and uh, they have to post, that they live a life thinking people that have to, uh, how they live a life thinking how people should uh, see them, right? So, Right. So, do you do you do you see this uh, this young people doing this? It's like uh, uh, you know uh, a different way of what you have seen in the past. People that want to be uh, celebrities, or you think that by doing this is uh, they ruin the way that they approach life? I don't know. Uh, what do you think? They choose the. The shortcut, obviously, and we are all photographers. Mm -hmm. Tonight, I'm sure nobody has the courage to say, every photo I do is a piece of shit. Everybody's a good photographer. Thank to the, everybody, everybody. You see, people, they don't, they don't look at you. Mm -hmm. They look at you at, uh, through the camera. I, I always remember, I, w I did the Chicago <laughs> Art Fair in the, well, for me with the numbers, it's terrible, anyway. At the beginning, when I moved to New York, it was maybe 82, 84, 85. And I had a beautiful show of Guccione, the painter that, and thanks to Cady Goodman, we did a Guccione show in America, in New York. It was the first uh, unique show we did in New York, uh, thanks to Cady, who had the sensibility to understand this great painter. So but anyway, we, I did, and I had a beautiful booth, one man show, of and they were all looking, there was not yet the, the catalog, I did the catalog. And they were saying, look at that, look at that. I said, but why you don't look at that? <laughs> I don't know why, you know, people image, it, it's, it's, it's a different approach. So young people now today, but we will, we, we will go back. We will go back, no, really, because you know, like for example in Italy at the moment you have no good movies, that's my opinion, no good books. Not be, I look like be Matusalem, an old man of 90, <laughs> I'm 77, but, there were great books in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, and good writers. Now, movies in Italy, you can't go to see a movie. They're all stupid comedy. And mm -hmm. But we used to do in Italy La Commedia Italiana, which has been a movement. You know, we always talk about uh, neorealism, realism, you know. But uh, all what went after, what afterwards was very important. If you go and see all the movies of the, in Italy, they, they did the Commedia Italiana. There are all the movies who describe you, I was Rome, I was a, a style of life that doesn't exist anymore. So, and uh, you know, it's not that to be nostalgic. I'm not nostalgic, actually, I, I don't care. So I left because, you know, <coughs> when a guy came in the gallery one day and they told me, you know, I, came, I come to you, you have to give me an advice because you know everything. I say, okay, that's the moment I have to leave. I don't know anything, I don't know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't hear very well. This is the proof, so I want to hear. I don't think that Shoja or Vincent would have been so patient to do that. <laughs> After many important international galleries left in Rome, now that Gabbiano is closed, no, no, which no, ones? Gabbiano, let's make, Gabbiano was not, yeah, it was, was important for the Roman, for the Italian well, style. Yes. Like, they are, they moved, they came. When I, uh, because I had this crazy idea, thanks to my friend, my two friends, the Rustov, who architect, they say, okay, you talk, we want to, because I want to remake a modern gallery. The gallery was an old fashioned gallery. I'm sorry, I have to tell you. So they said, okay, we do it for free. It's incredible, it's big, he did the MoMA, she did a lot of work. It was IMP, so they came to Rome several times and they did a beautiful space. The day I opened the new space, Gagosian arrived. Gagosian. And the following Gagosian, other gallery. There is a lot of important gallery now. I haven't been in Rome too long, for too long, I can't tell you, but there is a, uh, Lord Caunil at the gallery. There is a lot, an art scene, I don't know if they sell or how they sell, but anyway, they, they are coming, there are a lot of galleries they are opening. Not like they are doing in London. In the, they are all going to London. The Italians, they are all going to move to London and there is, everybody has a gallery in London, even the New York 
gallery as a gallery in London, in for was Germany. Now it's Britain. You know, maybe people doesn't like Europe, <laughs> so they like the Britain is outside of Europe. So let's go somewhere where there are no European. They are British. They are Italian. They are Spanish. So that is only Gagosian of really important. Gagosian is the important. I don't know how important it is. This is mega. Yeah. Mega space that, uh, and Marlboro doesn't take Marlboro closed in uh, when uh, Marlboro closed um, for a political reason because there was a moment in Italy uh, that almost uh, the Communist Party w won the election very short, uh, the, and then Marlboro closed the day after. Well, the day uh, after they closed. Uh, what elections? There was an election in Italy. If you go oh, in, in, in internet. <laughs> It was right. the only election where the Communist Party was so high. I don't remember the age. I was a But alive. what was the connection with the... The connection is that the Marlboro didn't want to say in a communist country, so... Oh, uh, oh in a I communist country when the communists were progressing. I see, like that. Bust, I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is that? <laughs> and and I'm looking at Julia, who is the real moderator of the evening. Just, we were pretty good in not dropping too many names. You have to give us credit for that. And uh, uh, Vincent, you want to add something? Then I remind you that the book is upstairs, and there are a few copies, and Sandra will sign them for you. And I would like to thank again all the members of the panel. I think we had a wonderful conversation. Thank, thank you, you very Ava. much. Thank you. <laughs>